Hey everybody, this is Midnight Update. I'm Seamus Byrne. Welcome to Wednesday, the 20th of May. Hey everybody, I'm up here at a windy Collaroy. Uh, checking out the landing of the PPC-1 Pipe International submarine cable. This is the first independent submarine data cable to arrive in Australia. Uh, we've got some fun facts and figures to throw at you as we get a look. If you see just up here, there's the little smidgy boat off in the distance. Uh, we're going to get a close look at that later as well as the landing station uh, and all of the details of what's actually uh, what this is delivering to the local market. Um, to throw a few of the quick facts and figures at you, it's a 200 million dollar project um, and we're talking about a new capacity of 1.92 terabits of data capacity into the country. This is coming in via Guam which is one of those cool hubs uh, and I think regularly mentioned in Cryptonomicon. Um, uh, so this is uh, a really significant new submarine cable for Australia. They're claiming this is going to have a good impact on the, the price and availability of bandwidth uh, in the country. So that's always good news. I should probably point out at the start that when I first got invited up, for me in my head I thought this was going to be just a really cool bit of tech guy train spotting, watching a massive submarine cable uh, land in our country. But they've done a great job of pointing out all the reasons why this is actually going to be a really incredible moment for the future of Australian broadband. Now, I've mentioned that this adds 1.92 terabits of new capacity from Sydney to Guam. And what that kind of means in real terms is, A, we currently have around about 4 terabits coming into the country. Uh, so, yeah, that's on one level, that's about 50% increase in capacity. But all of that current capacity is controlled by tier one telcos, Telstra, Optus, those kind of guys. And this new cable is completely neutral from those guys. This is owned by Pipe Networks and it's all about being an independent backhaul that kills off monopoly control of pricing. This is the cable coming out of the ground right here. That cable is 4,787 kilometres long. We're talking uh, 78 repeater stations running down the total system length of 6,900 kilometres. Repeater stations about 92 k's apart. Uh, but anyway, back to the real terms of what this kind of means. Of the current capacity, only about 15% of the total capacity is in use. So as Pipe is saying, this isn't about capacity, it's about competition. I mean, if Pipe was to win all of the current business available, they could, they could actually deliver three times the current international capacity being used across the entire country. So capacity isn't the issue. But these guys have ISPs like iNet, like Internode already on board. So this is really going to genuinely uh, have a, a big impact on forcing prices down on some levels and usage limits pushing them up. Now that was kind of the claim at the start and you know it sounded like good business talk but I'm definitely convinced that there's no question that this is genuinely going to happen when this pipe goes live in September. Uh, but now we've uh, got some comments coming up from uh, the pipe CEO, Bevan Slattery, uh, on just how important this cable is to the local industry. So let's have a listen to what he had to say at the press conference at the launch. It's, it's very important for the country and I don't think the country necessarily realises it right now that whilst we have spare capacity on existing cable systems, this cable was about actually creating competition, reducing the cost of bandwidth to consumers uh, and, and, and reinvigorating the Australian marketplace. And what that translates to is if you're a consumer, your broadband will either A, get cheaper or you get a lot more content and downloads for the same dollar. And that's very important. I think the one statement we need to make as a company is that we're, we're now NBN ready. So regardless of what happens in the regulatory environment, regardless of who wins NBN or what happens with NBN, 
the one thing you can be guaranteed is that people are going to consume more and more data as time, time moves forward. And pipe networks and PPC1 now have the infrastructure to service all those competing carriers and whatever network it may be down the track. Once the, once the cable was pretty much a certainty, um, some of the existing cable operators started reducing their costs, um, and, and quite significantly. Now, obviously, when we launched the cable, we didn't make our pricing, you know, where the pricing was less 20%. We actually had to create a completely new benchmark. So you're seeing some of the benefits come through right now. But in terms of uh, how much users are going to get for a download quota, um, that's really up to the providers. And I know at the end of the day, the competitive market's going to, um, you know, going to make sure that, that they, they give as best value to the consumer. You know, I would expect there to be a significant uplift in the, the amount of download quota that consumers get, uh, you know, particularly within the first six to 12 months of being live. So the existing cable system service Australia, um, I think in total, uh, including the new Telstra Endeavour cable, there's about uh, three to four terabits of capacity, uh, let's, let's call it four. Um, this cable system has two terabits of capacity, and a terabit is um, 2,000 gigabits or uh, 2 million megabits per second. So uh, what it does, it, it, I suppose it boosts the existing capacity in Australia by, by about 50%. And, and the funny part is the existing cables are probably only utilised to about, you know, 15-20%. Um, and it's not because uh, there's not the demand for it, it's, it's that they've certainly wanted to keep the, um, some would say, monopoly rents uh, to a certain level and, and, and to certainly be a very good return on investment. Um, uh, so uh, the other thing that with the existing systems, they were built at a time when, uh, with the exception of uh, the Endeavour system, you know, the Southern Cross and AJC were built at a time when it cost a lot of money to build a cable. And also when the Aussie dollar was about 50 cents to the US. So, um, you know, you can actually replicate their systems a lot cheaper these days uh, than, what you, what, uh, than what they were back in 2000. So. so now for a quick look around the back end of this system. This particular room is the submarine room. Now this is where uh, the submarine cable is terminated, given all the power it needs, and then distributed out into the local networks. So this particular, uh, this is obviously racks of wonderful, wonderful fibre. Uh, and these are boxes of lasers. Uh, gotta love some lasers. But in this room, the, the whole system is delivered something like 5,000 volts of power. Um, and that can be run from either end. Uh, that, this is the main set of control boxes. Um, and it's just amazing to see uh, how super managed this stuff is. It's really all about power and they chose the location specifically because it could reliably be given its power. Now this is under the building. This is one of the, the big generator room where there are two massive uh, fuel generators should they need to kick in and deliver more power um, if something fails on the main power grid. So these things can deliver very, very uniform and massive power and then this is the big crazy UPS room uh, the huge uninterruptible power supply for the main uh, the main building and to wrap things up here's some interesting final thoughts from Bevan Slattery on just how dirty things got with the competition there's been some amazing things that have happened um, uh, first of all, you know, uh, there's the normal uh, fear and uncertainty and doubt campaign that's been spread. You know, it was quite remarkable. One of the tier ones remarked uh, two days before we landed in Guam, um, two days remarked that uh, before we did that, remarked that, oh, they haven't even got the ship. They don't even know what they're doing. And, and one of the key things we did with this contract, it's a completely turnkey contract with Tyco. And one of the reasons we select Tyco is that they own the ship. You know, they haven't got a lease it from someone. They own six ships like that. Um, they're, they're, they're the leading kind of provider and, we, and all the risk is on their head in terms of the supply what, we have no risk until the actual date of acceptance um, so kind of hearing this was quite remarkable and, and, and I knew the guy that, that, that told me that and I said look you know just let him know that by some miracle uh, the ship called the Decisive you know is going to turn up in Guam with 2,200 kilometres of spare cable on it and it's going to start laying it, you know, and then I said by another miracle, let's see if in four weeks time in Australia this ship called the Durable is going to turn up with 4,800 kilometres on it and let's see, see if that happens, see if lightning strikes twice. And, and, and now that's kind of, you know, that's pretty, I've, I've been, I think about July, August last year I, I, I received a, a, a disturbing phone call, you know, I think I was personally threatened uh, by a tier one, which was quite, quite a remarkable stance and, uh, and uh, 
and, and pretty much from that point forward, it, it certainly drove my resolve to uh, to stick it to him. So, so here we are today. I was right, he was wrong. So. <laughs> and that's all for tonight's update from up here at Collaroy. Thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to join me weeknights around midnight Sydney time for Daily Geek News and for more coverage, visit midnightupdate.com.